Our baby Isaac was diagnosed with stage four cancer and needed surgery for a tumor that took up half his abdomen. His odds were the flip of a coin. But at Seattle Children's, he had one of the most experienced pediatric cancer surgical teams in the nation, and they brought him back to 100% himself. Maybe 200%. For kids with the most complex surgical cases, it's not about beating the odds, it's about changing them. Find your hope at seattlechildrens.org. did our consultation um, with Seattle Nanny, and then we hired the first one that we met. So that wasn't my intent by any means, but you know, we were just really impressed with her. Um, I think I did meet with one after her just because I was like, let's make Seattle Nanny do their job. For sure, for sure. Um, but yeah, and then Isabel was interviewing other places and we didn't want to let her go. So it wasn't a long process for us. Our baby Isaac was diagnosed with stage four cancer and needed surgery for a tumor that took up half his abdomen. His odds were the flip of a coin. But at Seattle Children's, he had one of the most experienced pediatric cancer surgical teams in the nation, and they brought him back to 100% himself. Maybe 200%. For kids with the most complex surgical cases, it's not about beating the odds, it's about changing them. Find your hope at seattlechildrens.org. did our consultation um, with Seattle Nanny, and then we hired the first one that we met. So that wasn't my intent by any means, but you know, we were just really impressed with her. Um, I think I did meet with one after her just because I was like, let's make Seattle Nanny do their job. For sure, for sure. Um, but yeah, and then Isabel was interviewing other places and we didn't want to let her go. So it wasn't a long process for us.
Our baby Isaac was diagnosed with stage four cancer and needed surgery for a tumor that took up half his abdomen. His odds were the flip of a coin. But at Seattle Children's, he had one of the most experienced pediatric cancer surgical teams in the nation, and they brought him back to 100% himself. Maybe 200%. For kids with the most complex surgical cases, it's not about beating the odds, it's about changing them. Find your hope at seattlechildrens.org. did our consultation um, with Seattle Nanny, and then we hired the first one that we met. So that wasn't my intent by any means, but you know, we were just really impressed with her. Um, I think I did meet with one after her just because I was like, let's make Seattle Nanny do their job. For sure, for sure. Um, but yeah, and then Isabel was interviewing other places and we didn't want to let her go. So it wasn't a long process for us. Good evening and welcome. My name is Elaine Sulkin. I'm the publisher and CEO of Parent Map. We're excited to have you with us tonight. Thank you for joining us for Parent Ed Talk. Do you have your shit together? Preparing for life's what ifs with our friend and author, Chanel Reynolds. For those of you that may not be familiar with Parent Map, just like our parenting media partners tonight across the country, it's our business to build inclusive communities that inform, engage, and inspire parents like you and your family with hopefully plenty of fun along the way. We're all extremely focused on how to better serve families and being the parents and publishers that we are, we never settle for the status quo. It means that our deep community connections, family advocacy, and unique partnerships allow us to build a better village for families. So thank you for joining us. Before we begin, we'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. Tonight's webinar is going to be recorded so that everyone who registered and maybe couldn't make it will get to, get to see this recording and we'll use it for educational purposes as well. And we invite your questions. So during the course of Chanel's talk, please feel free to use the Q&A icon and we will do a Q&A at the end of her talk. Again, I wanna thank our media partners Baton Rouge Parents, Chicago Parent, Metro Parent in Detroit, New York Family, and NOLA Family in New Orleans. And also we wanna thank our event sponsors, Wayne County Community College District, Seattle Children's Hospital, Washington College Savings Plan, and Seattle Nanny Network. Take a deep breath. Chanel is gonna share some, some intensity. Her story is a tough one to start with. After losing her husband in a tragic accident, Chanel learned from firsthand experience that most of us in this country are living one accident or illness away from financial ruin. She founded the Get Your Shit Together website to help other people take care of estate planning tasks in order to be less, let's say, screwed up when life goes sideways. She's the author of What Matters Most, the Get Your Shit Together Guide to Wills, Money, Life Insurance, and Life's What Ifs. Thank you so much, Chanel, for joining us. And we look forward to hearing what you can say to educate us. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here uh, this evening. Parent Map has been 
um, in my life and on my kitchen table and on my phone for years and years and years as a, a Seattle parent through many uh, ages and stages. So it's a real pleasure to be here to be able to speak to uh, your community and what feels like my community. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Um, thank you for the like. It's going to be a bummer for a second, but I promise you stay with me and we're going to get to some good stuff and the bummer moments will be fewer, few and far between with some good uh, light hearted uh, and really helpful, relevant, I hope, information. So um, it's true. I found myself uh, in this work as, as many people do by, by accident, on accident, but because of an accident. It was um, shockingly about 12 years ago when I had a uh, almost kindergartner and my late husband went out for a bike ride and I was over at a friend's house after a long week and uh, we were doing what we called then steak night. Um, and I went into the other room to pick up my phone because it was in my purse because that apparently is what we did 12 years ago as we left our phones and our purses in the other room. Uh, to take a picture of my son. And that's when I noticed I had a, what seemed like dozens of uh, missed calls and voicemails from numbers that I didn't recognize. And my first inclination was to put the phone right back in the purse. Um, and I knew that something just wasn't right. Um, and that's the moment that if you ever see it in movies where the kind of camera zooms in and pulls out at the same time and it kind of feels like um, the world gets pulled out from under, underneath you. So the conversation or the phrase, get your shit together, really came from a moment, a very specific moment I had in the hospital after I uh, turned to my six weeks away from kindergarten son. Um, I knew something was really, really wrong. Um, I didn't know what was wrong, but I could tell from the lack of information on the phone, kind of the lack of information, the way it was, you know, the pause that says it all, uh, that something was wrong. So I told my son it was a surprise sleepover, grateful that I was at a friend's house, that I felt comfortable leaving him. You know, we weren't across town, we weren't um, traveling, we hadn't moved to a town where we didn't know anybody. Um, and I drove myself to the hospital. I actually drove first to the wrong hospital because I hadn't been to Harborview before. And for those of you in the Seattle area, or those of you who know it, like a level four one or something trauma center is, it's the hospital where the helicopter lands on, which is not where you want to have to go. Um, it's not where you want to have to go. Um, and that is also a place we got really incredible, amazing care. I would also want to absolutely say that. So I found myself in a spot where um, I was walking into the hospital and I didn't know if they were going to bring me down to the morgue or into the ER. Um, when I called around to try to figure out what hospital they had taken him to, um, the social worker picked up the phone and I knew from some friends who were social workers that that was um, not necessarily a good sign. Um, so after a day in the hospital, um, it was very apparent that he was hurt. We weren't sure what was going to happen in the phrase, um, get your shit together. Oh, I is because I said, oh no, I don't have my shit together at all. And if this is happening to me, what's happening to everybody else in, the, in all of these rooms in the ER and the ICUs, um, in, in hospitals all over the country. And I realized that for, uh, for me and our life then, you know, we've had, a you know, a growing family, we'd taken care of some of the things that were on the list that we knew we were supposed to do. And the maybe 50% of other things that we hadn't gotten around to or completed or updated or finished um, from that week in the hospital, um, day by day by day, there are um, when when life goes sideways, it can be very challenging to just have the capacity to be in the room, to be able to go home and try to comfort or soothe a, my child or a child or a family member or, or do anything else that um, requires a level of, of thinking and you know, caregiving skill. So as those days went by and we 
as the days went on and all of the tests came back saying that my husband's injuries were uh, as they described unrecoverable that both his his body and his brain had been hurt so severely that he wasn't ever, ever going to be able to wake up that he um he had not he once the paramedics got him he hadn't regained consciousness and so but because we had had some conversations, because we'd started to do our estate plans, and in fact had them completed. So when um, one of the dozens and dozens of questions while I was at the hospital, or or sometimes over the course of time, was, um, you know, where are your insurance policies? What kind of um, getting your affairs in order have you done? And I very um, happily is a complicated word, but I was relieved to say that we had gotten our estate plans done. And then while I was walking back into his room in the ICU, I realized that we had done them and they were sitting in my inbox um, as they had been sitting there for a few months and they hadn't been printed and they hadn't been signed. So while there were so like the question of whether he would live or die uh, was buzzing through my head, I also had to try to find our insurance card. And then I had to remember which policies we had. And then I had all of this additional buzzing and swirling of questions and wonders and worries and concerns that was um, kind of overflowing and, and making what is already an impossible situation um, even, even harder. So after a week in the hospital and all of the tests continued to come back saying that his injuries were unrecoverable. Because we had gone through the process of talking about um, our end of life plans as part of our estate plans, because we had um, met with an attorney, I think it was our pediatrician who said, you got to start saving for college and get some life insurance. We had um, half of the things done and those were life saving. And the other things that we hadn't necessarily done um, ended up, as I said, making a hard time much, much worse. So the that phrase, get your shit together, that I didn't have my shit together, um, stuck with me and I couldn't shake it. And so for a number of um, days and weeks and months going through the probate process, trying to figure out at first what probate was, um, having to figure out, you know, everything from how to get, um, trying to get into my late husband's phone, but I didn't know the password to finding where all of the accounts were that he managed that I didn't necessarily have passwords to. I realized that um, we kind of suck at, at planning for death and dying in this country and that it, that there must be a better way. And that for all of the things that we don't have control over in our lives, that taking care of a few of these things now can take five minutes or an hour and it saves and can save us all a mountain of headache and worry and wonder uh, or wondering or questioning or, or a lot of costs and a lot of confusion and a lot of additional turmoil um, or optional suffering during a time where uh, when we lose someone um, or when we worry we'll lose someone, there is there is the kind of human suffering that we, we just can't avoid. So what I would like to take you through and share with you are some of those key items, some of those core items that kept bubbling up over those days in the hospital and over those weeks afterwards. And even um, I'll share, uh, closing down an estate um, can take years and hundreds of hours. So there were a number of things that I, I kept thinking, if only I would have done that ahead of time, five minutes now or an hour now would have saved me weeks or dozens of hours um, or what felt like hundreds of hours in the future. Um, and I have to say that getting it done takes a lot less energy um, and worry than it does continue to procrastinate not wanting to get it done. So I'm really excited to share with you a couple of these core key things that I've learned. Um, and they are uh, there will be a couple of different ways that we can look at them. Uh, before I continue, I did not ever say law school or that I'm an attorney. Um, I also am not here to sell you insurance 
I'm not here to be your financial planner. Um, somebody once uh, jokingly called me the Aaron Brockovich of estate planning, and I embraced that so completely and fully. But I do really believe that we should be educated and aware and know what these things are and know what works for us and for our family. With that, I'm going to share a couple of slides with you. And I'll make sure that we have enough time for questions um, at the end. How's that sound? I'll take that as a yes. So here we go. So Get Your Shit Together is the website that I launched a few years after my husband had died. And that was a compilation of like, oh, wow, I really, really, really could have done a better job. And I wanted to share it out with a couple of friends or family and thought that a few hundred people would um, appreciate it. Uh, a few years later, I started a business and now I am working as a chief customer officer of trustworthy where we are out to wrangle and get all of this digital life management figured out so i'm going to take you through a little story of before after and always so getting your shit together before i mentioned that moment that feels like the world gets pulled out from underneath you and for so many days and so many weeks i really did feel like i had tumbled down a rabbit hole and for um somebody who is an extrovert, a Gemini, an ENFP. I was a project manager. Um, I'm a native English speaker. I was legally married. I was college educated. There were so many moments where I felt absolutely overwhelmed and completely paralyzed and unable to even figure out what the next thing was that I needed to do. And so at that moment in the hospital um, and many moments afterwards, trying to figure out what dying in test state was and probate stuff and um, being made whole and so many other phrases and uh, documents and terminology that I wasn't familiar with at all. All of these questions just kept continuing to come back up and it felt so overwhelming that trying to have some answers taken care of ahead of time feels like a ginormous relief. And my hope for myself and for everyone here and everyone, everyone, is that you don't have to do what um, I did uh, many times called, and I like to kind of call this like the loneliest Google in the world, but Googling late at night after you may or may not have had a couple glasses of wine, um, what do you do when someone dies is an overwhelming and um, terrible process. So I'm one of those people who really likes checklists. And so I recall the moment that I was... I don't know, a few weeks after my husband had died, my son was going into kindergarten. I was trying to figure out all the stuff that I had to figure out, like legal stuff and physician stuff and life insurance and wills. And I was supposed to start a diary and somebody was talking about financial forensics and the marriage license that I thought we had wasn't because that was the cute one that you put in a frame, but not the stamped one. And you need like dozens of death certificates and they need to be certified. So there was just so many, 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 many things going on much, you know, and, and not even counting the fact that I was like, oh, I need to get my son's immunization forms because he's starting school and I'm apparently on the playground committee and I have to try to get wood chips or something. So there was just way too many things that I didn't know where to start what to do or what was the most important thing. So this first checklist, as I like to call it, or this big blah list, and many of us have these kinds of rotating uh, concerns or task lists or, oh, what am I gonna do? So what I ended up doing over the course of a few years was trying to get just the snapshot. Like if I can get all this basic stuff of what I have to wrangle or keep my arms around and just get it on one or two pieces of paper that I can have on the kitchen counter. I can have my own little checklist and I can review it. So I, and these are the things um, that kept bubbling up to the top and kept uh, being, uh, you know, the number of times that you smack yourself on the forehead for not having done something. Um, there was like a permanent palm mark on the top of my head for a while. So what I did is I took that checklist and um, 
put it together in a little website, which is the way I knew how to make things and throw them out into the world. I suppose if I was a musician or a filmmaker, I would have written an album or made a documentary, but I put a little teeny website together and threw it out into the world and was very surprised that it got shared out really quickly and really widely. And then the next day, the New York Times called. And then that weekend, um, it was uh, ginormous. The site almost went down. And I don't know if, if uh, all y'all remember a certain kind of news moment, but I did look at the um, New York Times, like most read, most shared list. And it was me and my website. And then underneath it, um, Woody Allen is a pedophile. And then underneath that, Lindsay Lohan does porn. So let me just say, I think it was a really, really weird weekend to see your name up there. But what I realized from that is none of these people knew me and that this isn't just my story. This is everyone's story. And if you personally haven't gone through an experience like this yet, um, someone you know probably has, someone you work with probably has, a neighbor probably may have. Um, and it's something that we as uh, parents, uh, we as um, as you know, people who have parents, uh, those of us who have the kind of Gen Xer sandwich generation, trying to manage children, trying to manage our own lives, and then thinking about our extended or blended families and how we can help other people um, and you know, aging parents in particular, it can be a really overwhelming um, feeling of all of these things that you need to do, but having a checklist and a place to start keeps me centered in what I need to do. So there was checklist, there were some legal basics, there was having a handle on my insurance, there were some money basics and the details that kind of helped me get together with what this what if would have been. So I'm going to walk us through a couple of these, um, not extensively. And I have at the end of this a few slides with some um, follow up notes and some uh, resources and um, happy to share referrals as well. But the legal basic stuff that everybody who is 18 years old or older should have is, are basically kind of the big three items. And no matter which state you live in, uh, whether you have a uh, hundred million dollars or none million dollars, um, everybody needs to have a few things written down in the way that is legally binding in your state and share them with a couple of people. So there are fewer questions about what happens, you know, if or when something happens. And a will is the basic document, legal document, which talks about who gets what of your stuff, who's gonna be the project manager of your estate and uh, pay off debts and close out bank accounts. Guardianship over kids and pets is actually um, one of the main drivers and motivators for people to get their wills and estate plans done. It also, interestingly enough, or not shockingly at all, um, is a place where we tend to get stuck, um, figuring out and writing down who's going to take care of our kids and who's going to make them, you know, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and take them to school if we can't is, is a hard thing to think about. But let me um, recommend or um, reflect back to you what nearly every single attorney I've, I've talked to on this topic has said, which is something is better than nothing. And whenever you write down who you want to be, let's say the executor of your will or the guardian of your kids or your medical power of attorney, always have a backup. And then if you want to even have a third backup. So your will is, is a lot about uh, who gets what guardianship your money some people put funeral um, details in in your will um, if you have really specific thoughts about what kind of celebration of life or funeral or service or um, memorial that you might want to have sometimes wills don't get pulled out for a number of days or weeks or sometimes months if you've you know, think of the movie where the family's gathered around the desk and the attorney reads the will. So if you have specific thoughts or, or desires or, um, or wants for your funeral plans, that would be a good thing to pull also out of your will and have someplace a little more handy. So power of attorney. Power of attorney is um, who you elect uh, and designate to make choices for you uh, if and when you are not able. A power of attorney document um, is used not necessarily in an end of life situation. A will 
is uh, comes into effect after you are after you are dead. A power of attorney document often is used for not end of life situations, but um, if and when, let's say, the pandemic has given us um, unfortunately far too many examples of somebody who is very very ill or let's say on a ventilator and is not able to um, speak for themselves or make decisions or necessarily pay rent or take care of their finances uh, but it may not necessarily be an end of life situation uh, one of the things that i am going to um, highly 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 recommend that you think about and do and or include in any um, estate documents that you currently have, if you don't need to update them, is what's something called a digital power of attorney. Um, that is all of the emails and all of your um, entertainment accounts and all of the, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, files and artwork and accounts and social media accounts. Um, often it's, uh, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of photos, baby pictures, wedding pictures, um, all of these things that we have up in the cloud. And 12 years ago, when my husband died, we had dozens of accounts and passwords. And now we, uh, you know, the average person has more like six dozen different accounts. So wanting to make sure that things that um, you want to be found can be found is very important. And then also who might be the right person to um, have that digital power of attorney so they can um, open, keep open or close your social media accounts or, you know, and or um, be able to corral all of these things that we touch every day and that are part of our lives. So a living will uh, is also frequently called an advanced care directive. Those are your end of life wishes. That's the kind of care that you do and don't want uh, at the end of life. And my, in, in our particular situation, because we live in Washington state and there are only about 10 states that are community property states and actually only about 10 other states that are common law marriage states, because we were legally married, uh, who got to make the decisions, those end of life choices fell to me because that we were legally married and there weren't a lot of complications. So because the fact that we had talked through what he wanted and what he didn't want, and I'll also share that because that situation, our situation where he was um, so badly hurt and did not wake up from a coma and could not uh, recover, could not gain consciousness that what was even as the doctors had described as a more black and white scenario, um, as in there just wasn't a lot of gray space of could he get better if he did get better, how much better could he get? Um, I knew what his quality of life, um, definition of quality of life was and where he was then was <laughs> so far much farther than anything that he would have wanted that it was um, the hardest decision I had to make and the clearest, clearest, uh, least complicated, com not not uncomplicated, but the the it was the hardest and the easiest thing that I ever had to do because I know it was what he would have wanted and it was still really, 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 really hard to do. So I feel grateful um, that you know, as a single parent, and I've been a single parent for a long time uh, now, and, um, you know, I don't lay awake at night worrying or wondering about if, if that was the right thing to do to re remove medical support. As a parent, I have plenty of other things that keep me up at night, but um, knowing that that was what he wanted uh, is, has, has been, um, has been uh, in, in a way a, a blessing. And, and one of the things that uh, many people frequently talk about is, is not knowing um, not knowing and having to guess or not knowing what that quality of life means for somebody when, when you are being asked to um, advocate for them. So talking about quality of life and what that means to you is a really, really wonderful, helpful gift that you can give to yourself and, and everyone else. Um, I get a lot of questions about trusts and um, 
And like many, many attorneys, uh, if you ask a question like, hey, my mom lives in Virginia and should we do this one thing? Very frequently, uh, the answer is it depends or maybe it depends. So uh, trusts are a uh, an entity that uh, like a financial account or entity that you put your assets into so they no longer belong to you they belong to the trust trusts are something that uh, can be really really helpful to set up there are a lot of different uh, reasons why a, uh, a family or a person may or may not want to do it one uh, one important note about trust is if you are going to set up a trust you need to fund the trust and move the items um, into to be owned by the trust. Uh, the overwhelming majority of trusts that are set up are never funded. And so uh, there are um, a few additional steps that one needs to make to um, take advantage of setting one up if that's the, gonna be the right thing for, for you and your family. There are a ton of other documents. There are pour over wills and transfers and provisions and letters and, and many, many other things. But no matter exactly if it's five pages or five dozen pages um, and which state that you might live in, having a will, um, having a power of attorney document and having that living will or advanced care directive um, takes care of so many of those really important questions that, um, that, need, that, that people are going to ask and that can cause a lot of heartache and headache and stress and unnecessary additional um, suffering during what's already uh, most likely going to be a really hard time. Um, insurance. Um, we could talk for hours about insurance, but what I will say is that at any point in your life, um, at any point in a growing family's life, having enough of the right kind for your life right now is, is a really important thing to think about. Um, when we were a growing family and there were two parents and my son and stepdaughter, uh, we needed a different kind of coverage. We needed, uh, you know, disability was something that we had offered through work. It's a great thing. The disability, uh, whether short or long term, is more expensive than life insurance. And the reason why that is, is because uh, we as adults are much more likely to use it. Uh, if you can, you know, look into disability insurance, if you have it offered to you, the quote uh, or the statistic is generally about a third of, of adults in the U.S. are going to uh, be disabled for three months or more during their adult lifetime. So um, having some insurance to cover you and or having a emergency savings to kind of fund that uh, that time is, is really important to think about. Life insurance, um, we had some, we hadn't updated in a while and we had less than what the um, you know average recommendation is, but I, I will share that having a, a little bit of a financial life raft and having some time gave me options and helped create this bridge from the old life to my new one. And so life insurance as, um, the type of life insurance that we had when we were, let's say, in our 30s as a young growing family with kids versus the kind of insurance I would uh, still need in my 40s or 50s with more adult children or ch children who are college age or in their 20s starting their you know, own lives. It, it can change over time, but take a look at, at the options that you have. If, and if you haven't looked at your policies or renewed them or, or checked to see if it was the right, if it's still the right kind um, and if it's still the right amount that you need, it's a good thing to do uh, once a year or pull it out and dust it off and look at it with your estate plans and your wills at least every election cycle is what I like to say. Uh, Long-term care, Washington State, where I live, um, has now mandated it, and Washington State um, is frequently one of the uh, lead states on a number of things, and so if you are um, in Washington State, then this, this is something that you, you've had to look into. If you're not, um, doing a little bit of research on long-term care and what your options are uh, would be an interesting thing to do just to know what it is and what's coming because it may be coming to a state near you. There are tons of other kinds of insurance, but I'll say that for planning for um, 
planning for the worst or planning for if something happens, uh, having, having had some life insurance and having shored up uh, our insurance was a, a really, really helpful thing for me. So that would be something that you could look into. Um, many people ha already have it and it's covered through um, your work. You can ask for a referral from friends, um, like any kind of contract. Uh, you know, if you're getting a new car or a new refrigerator or a new furnace, you should get a couple of quotes. You should ask a lot of questions and you should look at the fine print because there are some exclusions for uh, things like if you are an ice climber or a small uh, aircraft or um, scuba diving, or there are some there are there are some exclusions in there that would make a policy that you would buy um, not valid. Okay, so money, um, money. You know, uh, there is a reporter named Ron Lieber, and he actually has an article that I will refer you to at the end of the slide, but he has a phrase called money is feelings. And so when we're talking about money, especially when it comes to planning for emergencies or end of life planning, it can be really, really um, challenging. So there are a few things that can be really, really helpful. One is uh, having an emergency fund. And an emergency fund for us at that time uh, was really, really small. We had been paying a ton of money for childcare and I had been planning to go back to work full time. And so our savings account had been getting a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller. So when my, uh, my late husband died, I was in a spot where, where we didn't really have a very well-funded or our, our emergency fund didn't wouldn't last that long and that was pretty darn terrifying and so having whatever kind of cushion you can have even if it's putting five dollars or fifty dollars or depending on your income you know a lot more dollars into an emergency fund can really help buffer um, these life changes and transitions i'll say many of us myself included um, had been doing these what if plans for a long time and I didn't necessarily see a global pandemic pandemic coming and it has really knocked a lot of families sideways. Um, saving and spending there are a number of ways people can talk about um, you know budgeting, but uh, I like to think about money that uh, and finances that you need right now pretty soon and then long term. Um, the essential details so this kind of wrangle up your your digital details and your contact information, you know, the phrase, the devil is in the details, really, 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 really rang true for me um, about 5,000 times during that time in the hospital and the weeks and months and years afterwards of anything from those first moments in the hospital uh, when I arrived and somebody handed me his phone and it hadn't been smashed to bits and it was uh, working except for I didn't have the number to open it up. I didn't have the passcode. Um, I tried and tried and tried and tried and every time I got the wrong one, it would start to lock me out and then lock me out for longer. All these years later, I still don't have it. And so some basic in case of emergency information sharing uh, your most important passwords to be able to get into your phone or your laptop or your desktop computer or your tablet where you have your information using a password manager. But having this, um, ha being able to access the information that you need when you need it and not having to spend, you know, five minutes or you know, an hour digging through the files and the tubs underneath the bed and then the basement or where's this one, you know, where's one of those four places that I have the files. Um, it really, really helps to be able to have it in one spot and then actually be and be able to have a backup and a digital backup as well. So wrangling all of the details and I have a short version of a checklist and I have a very long version of, of a of a wrangle your details checklist and I would highly recommend that you look at that the same way that you look at changing out let's say your furnace filters or the oil in your car or getting your mammogram done yearly or every other year depending on your schedule but having that information your information this is the the numbers and the people 
available and the policy numbers that that you own that are your assets having them available um, and not scattered all over the place is uh it makes me feel better that i know i have i have it here and i also have it someplace else as a backup and this brings me to the what ifs so a lot of um the financial planning frequently the estate planning um insurance stuff we talk about these um like you know in a number of different ways and i find that they all can be pretty uh easy to procrastinate and not that exciting so one of the things that when i talk about wills and we're talking about emergency planning we're talking about insurance um is that these are the things that are really set up for you to make your life more comfortable more stable or secure avoid more risk and to um, help cover the weak spots in the areas that are most important to you so the what if scenarios for me are what happens if something happens um, not necessarily like how to maximize your this and that and avoid this and wealth transfer and and all of that all of those things are valid and important and most of or much of the benefits of having my estate plans done, the benefits of having an emergency contact list, the benefit of having a password manager. So if something happens, I know someone can go in and find the things I want them to find um, is that I don't have to spend any more time worrying about it or thinking about it. I kind of put it in the set it and forget it or set it and update it category. So the what ifs for me, uh really came when it had been a couple of years i had set up get your shit together a little teeny website and i really wanted to figure out what happened after so one of the things that i realized was once i i just skipped ahead that's okay we'll go back if we need to once i started the get your shit together website it was a list of things that i really wish that i would have done and I wanted to really help and promote and advocate for all of us to get these things done before something happens. What I hadn't quite realized or thought about was that because you know half of US adults don't have their wills done and fewer have their end of life plans, their um, um, advanced care directives done, you know, many of us don't have our finances done. You know, I think it's 10% or under uh, of people use a password manager. When something happens, even if we are the most organized, a lot of stuff kind of blows up and falls apart. So where to get started and what the most important thing to do is, is I get questions about that a lot. So there was a list of items, legal, financial, insurance, gather your details. For me, and one of the things that I think helps with a centering place or put a stake in the ground and figure out where to start is I tend to think about things a little bit differently than always practically or tactically. So the items that are most important for me to do next or where to start are the things that keep me up at night. If it's been keeping me up at night for days or weeks or years, I want to knock that off the list. If it's something that's been on my list for years, and I've talked to a number of people, thousands of people, um, and you know myself included, some of the things like getting your estate planning done, or finally rolling over that 401k, or getting you know that one doctor appointment made, those things can really sit there on our list for years, and that happens, and that's fine. But if there are some things that have been on there for a really long time, it feels really good to get those done. So I would highly recommend, if it keeps you up at night. If it's been on your list for a long time, or if you're going to be really relieved that it's done, that is an excellent place to start. The other thing that I think about too is the what if plans. And so one of the ways that I think about this is the all the things that I wish I would have done before. What happened after the mayhem and the, for lack of a better word, just shit show of things, the calls and the confusion. And, you know, it was grief and loss and losing somebody um as you know many of us have have experienced um it is such a leveler it's kind of 
hard, you know, there were a number of days where, and weeks and months, and then I would go back sometimes to that feeling where like getting up in the morning and finding like some clean clothes or putting on pants and getting my kid to school on time was a gigantic accomplishment. And so what happens if something happens? And then what would you need to make that? What would make you feel better? What are the levers you have or the options that you can set up for your future self? So what if something happened? And this is not an exercise to get us to spinning about all the thousands of things because it generally the what if scenarioing is something that we're already generally pretty good at but if something happened think about it like um earthquake planning for the first 24 or 48 hours what would you want what would you need do you need to have an extra key set up so someone can check in on your pet uh, do you have caregiver responsibilities? Do you need to have some money set aside? Do you want to have a credit card so you can hop on a plane at a moment's notice? What contact information do you need to have? Um, what passwords would you need to have? So if something happened, what are those things that you would want to have? Um, and then that would be a good thing to start um, creating that care package for you and yourself and your family um, now so you have it when you need it. What's that go bag for your emergency planning? The next way I think about it is, so what if that thing that happened kept happening? So something happened, someone got sick, you need to go out of state. What kind of uh, paperwork might you need? One of the things that I have in my guardianship provision for my uh, kids is I have a guardian, I have a backup person, and then I also have a temporary guardian. And I have that set up so if something were to happen and I needed to leave town, that um, questions about who who or what was supposed to step in, uh, someone is set up to be a guardian for two weeks. And that would allow, let's say, the full-time guardian to you know, move back here, or if they were delayed, or if there was an illness. So it just creates some extra options. Um, and then after that, what happened if something happened and then it keeps happening? And so this is a scenario where we would talk about let's say disability insurance or really needing that emergency plan or having some options for um, whatever that might look like for you. But um, the what if planning makes me feel like I'm not just going through a task list of documents and stuff that other people tell me that I need to do, but it's really harnessing and taking advantage of the fact that there are people who are experts in insurance and estate planning and that you want to take the best of what they have and 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 curate the documents and the policies and the plans that work best for you in your life. Um, of course, things don't always go the way you plan. I have um, spent eight or 10 years doing what if planning and disaster planning. And I will say again that the, the pandemic really, really, really knocked me sideways uh, and surprised me all over again. One of the things, or some of the things that were really helpful is that I had um, less, <laughs> less global pandemic preparations in place, but I, when that hit and we didn't know what was gonna happen and we didn't know for how long, one of the things that I was grateful for, um, and you know, I, I'll also say that, uh, you know, no one in my immediate family got, got sick because of COVID uh, or died. However, that, um, the preparations that I'd done and the planning that I had, I knew that if something happened, I knew that if my parents who live out of town got sick, I had some backup plans in, in place and I had to update them and, and make them um, a little more rapid and um, extensive. But I had a number of things in place. So I knew that if something happened or when something happened, that a number of those documents would be there that during a time of change or planning for um, an emergency or or a death was something that I, I had a foundation for. One of the things I also realized was that um, planning for the death or taking care of like the business of death um, is a great foundation for what really needs to be taking care of the business of, of your life. And so one of the um, exciting new ways that I'm looking at how we can all get our shit together is with a new company called Trustworthy. And one of the things that I would love to share in that is that when you're thinking about um, the things that you would need if something happened, um, 
those things that we need on a daily basis, if you think about your policies, if you think about your passwords, if you think about your email account, you know, the number of times that you have to update your Netflix account or whatever it is, those things that we need and want on a daily basis kind of become a little bit of a death by a thousand paper cuts if and when you need them all right away right now because something really catastrophic is happening. If, if we can back that up into um, integrating into our lives, writing it into the spec or the, blue, the, the blueprint of um, how we plan and leave ourselves breadcrumbs or, or those little answers in advance, uh, for me and for a number of people, um, it can take those big moments of like, oh my God, what's happening uh, in the hospital and how much better can he get? And what if he lives and what if he dies, what's gonna happen and take, maybe not, um, you know, we can't plan ourselves or emergency plan ourselves out of anything happening, anything bad happening, but, but and one of the things that I have found is having a few answers set up ahead of time, a few breadcrumbs or some passwords or some legal documents or knowing what would happen next if something happened means you're not thinking about it for the first time um, and problem solving it for the first time when something happens. And so you have some answers prepared and ready for you. So in a world where there is so much that's out of our control, taking care of some of the things that we can change imperfectly um, or perhaps not 100% completely, but 80 or 90% uh, more done um, well or good enough allows you to have that foundation. So you, you have some answers waiting for you. So a couple of the things that I am going to ask us and challenge you to is, is how do you do this and how do you take care of this in in a few minutes right like you don't have to clear your schedule for a week and 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 you can if you want to but you can start getting your shit together and you can make actual actual um, progress in five minutes or less so here are some things that you can do that i think uh you know do all of them do one of them, do some of them, do something else, but there's a checklist that you can download for free um, off my website. There are lots of information about digital details and passwords that you can read and get um, good advice and tips that are also free. Updating your beneficiaries. If you remember anything <laughs> that I said, um, beneficiaries on your financial and your banking accounts, those are, those are things that aren't probatable. They, you can write them down in your will, but whoever is listed or not listed, or you wrote down 20 years ago, but you didn't update it after the divorce, um, your, who you write down as the beneficiary on your 401ks, on your investment accounts, on your banking account, anything that has like money or investment or finances, you can almost always update the beneficiary online and leave a backup. Those two are things that you should look at and update. Go to each of your banking websites, go to your account area, update the beneficiaries, do all of them in one sitting or do, do them one each day and it takes five minutes. Um, there are a couple other articles here that I think would be really helpful, perhaps if you'd like. And um, there are a couple other things that you can do. Uh, these are not necessarily free, but if you are interested, um, I offer courses and I do them on a monthly basis. You can sign up for one and you can get a, you can get a 20% off because I love my parent map family. Um, you can try trustworthy. There's a two week free trial. And then there will also be a email that goes out as a follow-up for all of you. Um, and I'll have a couple more resources listed on this, get your shit together page on my website for the parent map event, um, listing some things that I really, really um, would love for you all to just at the very least take one thing and five minutes of your time to update something that you don't have to worry or wonder about anymore, um, or at least for a while. So with that, I'd like to thank you so much for all of your time. And I would be happy to take questions as many as you have. We'll stay up all night. Um, Chanel, that was fantastic, honestly. And what's amazing is we do have a lot of questions, but you've answered so many of them. It's extraordinary. So I'm going to jump in, you know, so we can get a couple in before we have, a, we have about five minutes. I know you're willing to stay up, but 
I traveled from the East Coast that, this morning. I'm exhausted. So we're going to respect the time, but everyone will get a copy of the recording and all the lists. So um, first, very practical. What are your thoughts on the Washington State long-term care insurance tax? Um, you know, a couple of things. One is it's here and whether we like it or not, we got it. So th that's that. Um, a lot of people probably were really uncomfortable with and didn't understand what this new social security business was, you know, a few generations ago, and it's become just ingrained in our, in our lives. And it's meant to help those who really need help not suffer and live in poverty. So um, if you miss the deadline and you live in Washington state, you can still uh, work on getting another policy. You can still um, get out of the default one. But um, you know, I think that uh, I think that many people are going who, who would not have the option of having what is very expensive care uh, will receive some medical benefits that they are going to desperately need. So mm -hmm. that's and also what I think doesn't matter because it's, it's law now. So we got to do it. <laughs> sure. um, as a stay at home mom, what kind of life insurance should I have since I don't contribute financially? Um, so life insurance is uh, often thought of as something that is supposed to replace income. So um, there's income that somebody else pays you for, and then there's the work that you do, right? So if this person who asked the question is has a spouse who is the breadwinner, um, that person who brings the money in, the actual, like the dollar dollars, um, what kind of additional financial support would that household need that um spouse or single single mom who doesn't who, who does it doesn't work sorry i'm getting confused is it a single mom single parent okay so the 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 real deal is like life insurance is there to help cover um help cover the income or the care if you're not there to do it so whether um you uh, are bringing in a, a gazillion dollars or whether you provide the care that costs a lot of money for somebody else to do life insurance is meant to um sorry the, the this is a stay-at-home mom asking you know you're 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 answering the question she doesn't contribute financially so should there be life insurance on her i would i would say that life insurance is it, the answer is is maybe and probably so if she's not there as a stay at home mom, there is somebody else who is going to be doing work that she's not there to do. Um, are there going to be costs for therapy? Are there going to be costs for um, child care? Are there going to be costs for tutoring and household expenses? And so if the if if she's not there to do those things, who is going to be doing them? And does does that happen? household have the financial capacity to cover that now or not. Um, if that's not the case, um, you could get some some life insurance to help cover that. Also, you know, the average funeral is somewhere between eight to $14,000. And I also think that life insurance is really important to have because when some dies, it really sucks and you're sad. And the last thing you want to do is like, go back to work two weeks later, many people have to, and I could pull myself up off the floor sometimes. So um, having a cushion to help get whatever next looks like set up, um, it's not a bad thing at all. Life insurance is meant to help bridge your family and your household's life from the one you have now to the one you have next. It's not necessarily about dollar for dollar. I don't think that's, what it's, that's not what I think it's most valuable for. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to thank you. And we, again, as we said, everyone will have access to Chanel. She, thank you so much. And we will send the recording and all the resources that you provided. And I am going to actually get my shit together in a way that I haven't yet. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.